Good morning, Silver Creek Fellowship. Welcome to our service today. We're so glad that you've decided to join us. My name is Corey and this is Rhonda. Good morning. And we just wanna share some of the stuff going on at Silver Creek Fellowship. And I've gotta tell you, there is lots of stuff to talk about that's coming up. So buckle up, pay attention. It's some really, really good stuff. So what's, what's the first thing we have? Hey, well, we are going to be just online services for right now, correct? And we're taking today. it today, yes. yes. And then we'll transition into some limited in person. So you're going to need to sign up and plan ahead a little bit more. I know we like to come late to things at this church a little bit, but <laughs> we're going to go to scf.tv, right. sign up and um, just check it week to week. We'll let you know because things are always changing, correct? Exactly. So it's the best we can do. And we'll let you know what the limit is and save your seat. That's right. You guys all know that you never quite know what's going to happen. We could make a plan for two weeks from now, mm. but who knows, the rules might change between now and then. So make sure you always check on our website to see the latest details. Another great way to know what's coming up and to know the details about what's happening is our e-news. And yes. we've talked about this a few times, but it's really, really, really important. If you consider Silver Creek Fellowship to be your church home, you should really sign up for that and read it. It comes out every Friday and it's got details about things like church services, changes, you know, announcements for things that are coming up. Some really important stuff. And actually, one of my favorite uh, announcements this week, it was in the E! News just, just on Friday. If you got it, you would have seen We've got some exciting new stuff happening for our kids ministry. kids ministry. Yes, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually let our new children's pastor, Renee Hunter, she's gonna share some with you right now about our kids ministry. Hi everyone, my name is Renee Hunter and I'm here at the SEF Kids Lodge with Bruce and Marty. And I have an exciting announcement. SCF Kids will be starting up again, but in a whole new way. Here's how it will work. For those of you who sign up, we are going to be emailing you our weekly kids videos, which are awesome by the way, and they will be geared towards your child's specific age group. The videos are fun to watch and have a fantastic biblical life application. Some of the preaching videos are so funny that I have laughed out loud previewing them in my office. Check this clip out. <gasps> Do you see that? Look! <gasps> Run away! Come on, Harriet! Don't look at me like that! Nah. Do not be afraid! <gasps> it's easy for you to say! <laughs> Along with the videos, you can sign up to have the weekly craft and a short handout delivered to your doorstep by Bruce Moose. If you don't want a home delivery or live more than 10 miles out of Silverton, you can still pick it up here at the church once a week and Bruce Moose will be there to greet you there too. 
We think this will give your kids something to look forward to each week until we are meeting again in person. We will be sending out an email. Yes, I know you are all tired of emails, but this is so we can get you on our SCF Kids information list and get your most recent info like your kids' grade levels, current address, etc., so that we can get this started. So be looking for that email so we don't miss your family. If you are not already on our email list, you will be able to register on our website. So stay tuned for more information and I hope to see you all soon. So we are so excited about our new children's ministry. Hope that you um, sign up for that. Now coming up next is our Advent messages starting Sunday, right after Thanksgiving. We'll be having messages about uh, hope, peace, and joy. And, and also love. love. <laughs> There's a few extra, a few things, extra there, things. But that's all right. Yeah, it's going to be great. Uh, yes. Another thing, what else do we have uh, for Christmas, Christmas season? Christmas Eve, which uh, is my favorite. Yes. So we do have a special this year for Christmas Eve, a little different than we've done it in the past. We're going to do an online message that you can watch anytime it works for you and your family. So yep. there'll be a short message with. Oh, some, uh, yeah, we're going to have some music? story and uh, just uh, kind of sharing the Christmas story and also some music that goes along with it. It's going to be really great. Another thing that's exciting coming up this Christmas season, I'm really excited to talk about our Christmas light spectacular. Yay! It's going to be <laughs> awesome. Uh, we normally make a big deal out mm -hmm. of Christmas here at Silver Creek. We usually go pretty crazy decorating inside our building. And what we're going to do this year, we'll have a few d decorations inside, but since our meetings aren't going to mostly be in person probably through this uh, we're gonna put a huge amount of effort into outside, outside. <laughs> yes it's gonna be awesome we have Christmas lights that are being they're actually being set up right now they're gonna cover all of our buildings we're gonna have them out in the yard we've got all sorts cool. of awesome stuff and it's gonna be open to the community. Uh, December 4th is a Friday night. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, starting December 4th, and it'll be every weekend from then until the weekend after Christmas. So uh, it's gonna be awesome. If you wanna help out with that, um, it would be a great, great way it's to so serve, fun. to see some people in our community, to bless them, because we've got people that are, we need people to, to greet the cars mm -hmm. and say, welcome we've got people that are going to give them some hot yep. chocolate we even have a cocoa crew that's going to brew the hot chocolate the best hot chocolate in, in silverton town. yes it's going to be uh and if none of that sounds interesting to you that's okay maybe you're a christmas light techie we need some people that'll also be around to help power on and power off and troubleshoot anything that needs to be troubleshoot uh just during the time so it's going to be awesome we'd Don't love for you it. to sign up for that <laughs> scf.tv for more details uh so that you can be part yes i'm excited yeah i love to greet what else? Oh, our season of blessing. So we have a special offering for the Sunday after Thanksgiving all the way through Christmas weekend. And we set aside that gifting for special projects. Like if you remember, if you've been with us before, last year we did, um, we blessed people in town, local yes. businesses. We we sent some to Gabon for uh -huh. our training of leaders there and just lots of different things that are, are separate from our normal tithing. So yep. you can give lots of ways online. Just mark season of blessing, that on your check. Mm -hmm. um, and there'll be a special offering here at the church as well. Yeah, awesome. Well, we're ready to start our church service. Boy, that was a lot of stuff. Christmas is crazy. Mm -hmm. It's here, all sorts of things to be part of. Don't forget to fill out a connection card uh, if you're with us today. And if it's your first time with us, fill it out and we've got a gift that we'll send you just to say thank you for being part of what God's doing here at Silver Creek. If you're watching live, you can fill it out right now. The button's in the chat beside you or you can go to our website any time of the week, scf.tv slash connection. Well, let's get ready. We're gonna worship together. We're gonna sing. Let's lift our voices because God is great and he is worthy of our praise.
Hi, Silver Creek Fellowship family. Right now in our service, we're gonna take some time to continue with our worship by giving. This is an opportunity for us as a church to gather our resources together to make a difference in our community and in this world. Right now, our world is in desperate need of the people of God to be connected with the mission of God. And we can do that together by giving. If you're watching online right now, you can click the button that says give in the chat function and that'll take you to our giving page. You can always go to our website, scf.tv slash give. You could also just pull out your smartphone and load the Tithely app. You can give there. We want to encourage you to remember to take your time to give because God calls us as his people to put him first and he promises to bless us when we do. Church, we are better together and as we join our resources together, God is using us to make a difference. Hi, I'm Kurt Barnes, one of the staff members here at Silver Creek Fellowship and I'm so glad that you have joined us today. Now to start off today, I want to give you a little bit of news. I'm excited to tell you that beginning next week on the 29th, we will be broadcasting for the very first time live our service at 10 a.m. to you watching online. So our worship team, our teaching teams, our serving teams will all be here at the facility and we will be putting together a live service for you to participate right alongside us in real time um, from your own homes and living rooms. Now, we are limited right now to 25 people indoor, and so by the time we get our worship team and tech teams and everybody else here involved, that pretty much gets us to our maximum. But in the upcoming weeks, we're gonna be actually creating what we're gonna call video venues here around our campus so that we can get additional groups of 25 indoors with us in our facility that can view the service live in real time and worship together with a group of people. And we'll have a registration process for you to be able to get those reservations made. But for this next coming week, the 29th, will be online only, but it will be done live in real time. And I think that would be a wonderful change to our service so that we can really feel like we are together. Now, as the freeze that the governor has put in place uh, changes, if it changes, um, we're going to be allowed to have some people outside, some people in different venues, and we'll just increase our capacity as we are allowed to. So here's what I want to ask you to do. Would you please join with us in praying for this virus to be gone, for the people who are sick to be healed, and for the wisdom of our elected leaders and our church leaders, and for the unity of the body of Christ in these very difficult times that we are living? Okay, so now that's the news portion. Now, this sermon series that we've been in is called Follow Me. We felt it was important through this election season and through this difficult moment in history that we are living to really go back to the basics of what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And today I want to talk to you about what do we do if we're following Jesus and we mess up? What do we do if we make a mistake or we royally screw up our lives? How do we get back to following God? Now, as many of you may or may not know, my family are fanatical Disney fans. Our vacations growing up most often landed us in Disney World or in Disneyland, and that's a trend that my wife and I continued in our own adult life, and since we've had kids, now we've brought our kids into the Disney uh, mania along with us. Now, we were actually supposed to be in Disneyland this past June, but COVID-19 had different plans for us. Okay, so we love Disney. And one of the things I love about being a parent is that we get to introduce our kids to our favorite Disney movies and our favorite Disney stories and watch them experience them for the very first time. Now, recently we introduced our son Keegan to The Lion King. Now, I saw The Lion King in the movie theater in 1994 for the first time. Now, if you live on the moon and haven't seen The Lion King, shame on you. I'm gonna spoil this thing for you today. Okay, so do you remember in The Lion King, when the king lion, the father, Mufasa, falls from the cliff. Now, actually, he was pushed from the cliff by Scar. But do you remember when he fell from the cliff and he wasn't getting up? And you realize, wait a minute, Mufasa is dead. 
I remember watching this in the movie theater and I was like, wait a minute, this is supposed to be a kid's movie. This is the saddest thing I've ever seen in my life. But even more memorable to me, even uh, at that young age, was how Simba responded to his father Mufasa's death. Do you remember it? You see, Simba had gone to a place his father had told him not to go. And that willing act of defiance against his father contributed to his father's death. Now, there were larger forces at play than just that, but Simba didn't understand all of that. And in fact, Scar had really pointed out to Simba his responsibility in seeing his father killed. And do you remember Simba's response? He ran away. He was broken, he was crying, and he ended up living an entirely different life. Was it the worst life ever? No. Was it a life of crime? No. I mean, he even made some little buddies along the way. Remember Hakuna Matata and all of that other stuff. But he was miles away from where he was supposed to be. He was miles away from who he was supposed to be. And in running away, He had abandoned a world that desperately needed him to engage. Now, why do I mention this today? I have been in ministry long enough now to see this scene play out in lots of people's lives. People who were following God, who were following the Lord, but then something happened in their life. And now they're not the worst person in the world. They're not the worst guy or the worst girl, but they're over here doing something other than what God designed them for. An example of this, I was at Mac's place in Silverton uh, a few years ago, and I bumped into a friend from high school, and he was definitely visibly intoxicated. And he asked me, what are you doing now for a living? And I told him, well, I'm actually working for a church in Silverton, Silver Creek Fellowship. And he said, whoa, he said, I used to be a young life guy. And then he looked down at himself and he said, what happened to me? And he actually broke eye contact with me and he never looked at me again. He said, yeah, my brothers still do stuff like that. And I could just see this wave of shame come crashing over him. There was a time in his life where he had been excited about all the possibilities that following God might mean for him. He had been excited about pursuing a relationship with God and then something happened in his life and now he wasn't the worst human being that ever lived, but he had just drifted away from God. Now, my question for you today is this. What does God think about you? What does God think about you when you fail? So today, that's what we're going to look at. So we're going to talk today about the life of Peter. Peter, who was one of Jesus' earliest and closest disciples. And he was the one that followed God with all of his heart, but maybe only like half of his brain, with half of his mind. Do you know what I mean? Peter, he was the guy that was always going to rush into every situation without really thinking it through all the way. And in the middle of Jesus' ministry, there's this moment where he asks his disciples, who do you guys think that I am? And it was Peter that came up with the answer. It was Peter that had the courage to speak up. And he said, I think you're the son of God. And Jesus said, that's right, Peter. But then just one moment later in the text, Jesus says, I'm going to go to the cross for you guys. And Peter stops Jesus and says, he rebukes Jesus and says, no, 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 no more talking about crosses around here. And he rebukes the very person that he just said was the son of God, the Messiah. Now, on the night that Jesus was betrayed and arrested, Jesus asked his disciples to stay awake with him in the garden and to pray. But instead, they just kept falling asleep over and over. Now, soldiers come into the garden to arrest Jesus, and the disciples finally wake up, and it's Peter who jumps into action, pulls out his fishing knife, lunges at the soldiers, and actually misses uh, the soldier's head and instead chops the soldier's ear. And Jesus says, Peter, stop it. And then they arrest Jesus and they lead him to the courtyard and Peter and John end up following behind. And they're there in the midst of this terrible night and Peter's watching as everyone is mocking and rejecting Jesus. And in that context, someone comes up to Jesus, I mean to Peter and says, hey, aren't you one of the people who was with that guy? 
Peter says, no, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know him. He says, are you sure? He says, no, I don't know him. I thought I saw you with him. Aren't you one of his followers? Nope, I don't know him. I think you're one of his people. And he read three times this happens. And the text tells us that not only did the rooster start crowing at that moment when Peter denied Jesus that third time, the text says that Jesus looked right at Peter. Do you remember his response? The Bible says he ran away and cried. There was so much shame in Peter. And now we arrive in our text for today. Our text begins, it says this in John 21, 1. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Now, what is the after this in reference to? After this. After this is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. After the resurrection, Jesus had been appearing to people. So there was all this excitement that Jesus has come back from the grave. But there's also a lot of confusion still going on. And the angel comes to Mary Magdalene and he says this in Mark 16 verse 7. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. Now, I think the angel threw in the and Peter because Peter probably wouldn't have showed up otherwise. Why else single him out from the other disciples? Peter probably didn't think he would be invited to hang out with Jesus and the other disciples anymore. This is for the people who are still following and I've messed up. But the angel gives this beautiful command. Tell Peter, invite Peter and Peter. So Peter shows up. And yet, as we arrive in our text, we see when he gets there, we see what he does. In John 21, verse 3. Simon Peter said to them, the disciples, I am going fishing. Now, Commentators are divided on the significance of this verse. Some people say they went fishing because they were just trying to kill the time. They just wanted to have some fun. But it says later in the same text, you're going to see that they fished all night. Now, you don't fish all night with nets just for fun to pass the time. So I think it's important to remember who it is here that's talking, who it is that said, I'm going fishing. It's Peter. Now, let me give you an example of what I mean. If I said to my wife, Summer, I'm going to play basketball, she would understand that what I mean is I'm going outside to throw the round ball into the hoop and hopefully make it through the basket. She would be right. But I can remember when Michael Jordan held a press conference uh, a little after his retirement. He had retired for just one season and went on a silly little trip to play a year of baseball. But after the baseball season was done, he held a press conference. And he came out and he said those exact same words. I am going to play basketball. And no one at the press conference said, well, what do you mean, Mike? Uh, like, are you going to go play in your driveway with your kids? Everyone there understood what Michael Jordan was saying because Michael Jordan was a professional basketball player. He was announcing a career move. Remember, this is Peter talking, a career fisherman, just like his father before him and his father before him. And right up until the moment that Jesus first called Peter, fishing was the only life that Peter had ever known. And Jesus said to him, Put your nets down, Peter, because I have a whole new life for you following me. And then Peter betrayed Jesus. He messed up big time. So Peter gets there and says, you know what, guys? I'm going fishing. I'm not going to be the worst guy you've ever met, but I'm going to be over here doing what I know. And I'll be honest, I run into a lot of people who are like Peter. What did he do? He goes to work and he gets busy. I meet a lot of people who to wall out the shame, to wall out the bad choices that you've made or the tragic things that have happened to you along the way, you just get busy and you go back and forth between busyness and distraction. You jump into your work with both 
feet. You dive into something looking for anything you can get a win at. But when that doesn't fill the void, you look for something else to distract you, something else to take the edge off, something else to take away the pain. And you pinball back and forth between busyness and distraction, busyness and distraction. And Peter looks in this moment and he says, I don't know how to deal with all of this. So I'm just going to go do what I know how to do. I'm going fishing. And it says in the same text, the other disciples said, we'll go with you. Because you need to remember, Peter is a leader and he influences the other disciples. You too, by the way, are a leader. You do know that, right? Our lives carry weight. And I talk to a lot of people who say, it's just my life. It's just my direction. No, it is not. You influence other people. And so Peter says, I'm going fishing. And they go with him. But I just love God's sense of humor that you see here. Because the text tells us in the next verse, verse 3, they went out and got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Verse 4. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Jesus is coming for them. Verse 5, Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? There's one older Bible translation that Jesus calls them brothers, which I think is really unfortunate because he doesn't use the word brothers. He uses the word for children, the masculine form of the word children. He calls them little boys. And he asks them this question. And there's lots of ways to ask a question in the original language. But Jesus asked a question that assumes a negative answer. When Jesus walks up on the shore, he says to them, Little boys, you don't have any fish, do you? See, he's saying the way you guys have chosen again to live your life isn't working out, is it? And I love that it says how the disciples answered him. Verse 5, they answer, no. So he says to them in verse 6, cast the nets on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. Now, some of you hear this story and you say, oh yeah, I'm familiar with this story. I've heard this story before. Fished all night but caught no fishes, right? You've heard this story before. And actually, you're right, because this story actually takes place two different times in the Gospels. It takes place here, and it takes place at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, way back in Luke chapter 7, because this is not the first time Jesus performed this miracle. He does it here, and he did it at the beginning of his ministry. On what day? The very first day that he called Peter to be his disciple and to follow him. And I love the way that the chosen TV show captures this moment because you really feel in the beginning when Jesus first called Peter to follow him, the frustration of Peter with the whole situation. Because the Bible tells us that Peter had fished just like this time. He'd fished all night but caught nothing. He was exhausted and he was empty handed. He had nothing to show for all of his work. And now Jesus shows up on the shore with his brother uh, Andrew and says, hey, let's go back out fishing again. Peter's like, I just fished all night and I didn't catch anything. And he's frustrated. And yet they decide to get back in the boat and go out and fish again for another uh, try. Now, they always fished at night, not during the day. So you can just think of Peter, a professional fisherman. He's been doing this his whole life. And now Jesus shows up, a carpenter who doesn't know anything about fishing and tells him how he's going to catch more fish. So Peter is frustrated by this whole thing until he finally decides to obey Jesus. After going back out and catching nothing, Jesus says, why don't you try the other side of the boat? <laughs> Peter's like, oh, the other side of the boat. Yep, that's your grand plan. I'm going to throw my net out on the other side of my boat and now I'm going to catch all of these fish. But he obeys. And what happens? The nets are full of fish. In fact, it says they're bursting, they're so full. And in that moment, it suddenly dawns on Peter, the Messiah is stepped into his boat. The, the, the Son of God is there with him. And do you remember what Peter's response was? 
Peter fell on his knees and said, Get away from me, because I am not a good person. And do you remember Jesus' response? He said, No, I came for you, Peter. You are mine now. I have a whole new life for you, Peter. And don't miss this here. In this moment of our text today, in the moment of Peter's failure, in the moment where Peter denied Jesus, what did Jesus do? He recreated the same miracle that he used to call Peter. He recreated it to show him once again the invitation was still there for him to come and follow him. See, Jesus recreates the moment of their initial connection of how their relationship started to let Peter know and to let you know. You are not too far gone. And that's why John, who's in the boat with Peter, looks at him and says, it says verse 7, The disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It's the Lord! It's the Lord! This is for you, Peter, John says. He's calling out to you. And it's the same with you today. What does God do? How does God treat you when you fail? Is he harsh? Does he yell at you? Because some of you, that's what you think. Some of you hear the voice of condemnation in your head constantly, ringing out your failures, constantly repeating the voices of your past, the voices of your childhood, the voice that called you a loser and told you that you were not going to make it in this life. And I don't know what it was for you, but some of you hear that voice and you've attributed it to God. You imagine him on the shore saying, hey, you guys, get out of that boat. You're a bunch of failures. How could you do this to me? Some of you think he talks to you like that, but he's not like that. He's so kind. And he recreates the very same miracle that he used to call Peter, to, to show Peter and everyone else that the door was still open. And Peter does something that I'm hoping you will do today. He stops running away from God. And he starts moving towards him. Verse 7. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. Now, I love that. There's no more hiding for Peter. There's no more hiding from the shame. There's no more busyness to, to distract him away from what he's done. Peter, in that moment, starts moving towards Jesus, not away from him anymore. Was it pretty? No. He put his clothes on in order to dive into the water. Who does that, right? If you're going to dive in the water, you take their garment off, not put it back on. And it says he threw himself into the sea. This wasn't pretty. This wasn't, he jumped up on the bow and dove into the water. He threw himself into the sea. It was messy. Why? Because Peter was a mess. And John wants to show you that. I love throughout the Gospel of John, which I tell you all the time is my favorite gospel, I love the playfulness of John the author and the competition between him and Peter. And you really see it uh, beautifully here in verse 8. It says this, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. I've always pictured this. Uh, Peter throws himself in the water and starts swimming, and the disciples are like, there goes Peter again, and they just start rowing. And I always pictured them rowing past Peter saying, good job, buddy, keep swimming, you can do it, you can make it. And some of you are thinking today, that you are just too far away from God and there's no way you could possibly get back to following him. That you don't know how, you don't know what to do, you don't know where to start, you don't know the right words to say. But let me tell you this, it doesn't need to be pretty. It doesn't have to look clean. It just has to be honest. It doesn't have to be a smooth dive. It can just be literally throwing yourself clothed into the sea. And it counts as long as you're making progress towards Jesus. And so he arrives on the shore in verse 9 and it says this. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place 
with fish laid out on it and bread. I love that. Jesus has already got fish. See, he doesn't need anything that you are bringing to the table. He's already got everything he needs, but he still invites them to participate anyway. He says in verse 10, he said to them, bring some of the fish that you've caught. And then in verse 12, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. What does Jesus do to you when you're a failure? How does he talk to you? Does he whip the disciples into shape? Does he yell at them? Does he shout from the shore condemnations? No, he's kind. He's gentle. He cooked them breakfast. Now, why did he cook them breakfast? Because you eat breakfast with your family. You eat breakfast with people you love. And I don't know what you've been part of in this life. And I don't know what your hands have touched. And I don't know what your eyes have seen. I don't know what's been spoken over your life. But I do know the heart of God. And in the midst of Peter's greatest failure, Jesus recreates the moment that they first met and tells him, I still want you, Peter. And that's what he's saying to you today. Because that's what he's like. I read an interview recently with the actor George Clooney, who grew up in a very, very strict, traditional Catholic home, like only go to mass in Latin, strict. And as a kid, he said he would feel so much guilt and so much shame over his sin and over his failure that he would put gravel in his shoes and climb up on his bunk bed on the top bunk and jump off the bunk onto the floor to punish himself for his sins because he thought that's what God wanted because he had read about a saint that walked with pebbles in her shoes for penitence. But that's about as far from this story as you can get because that's not what Jesus is like. And when you fail, he's kind, he's gentle, and he cooks breakfast to demonstrate to his disciples that the relationship with Peter is still open. So they sit down at this charcoal fire. Another very interesting thing, at least to me, is that there's a bunch of different words used all throughout the Bible in the original language for fire. But this word, charcoal fire, is only found one other place in the Bible. It's only used twice. It's used here and it's used one other time. You know when that was? It was the night that Jesus betrayed Jesus that Peter betrayed Jesus. It was the type of fire, a charcoal fire, that Peter warmed himself around when he betrayed Jesus. And now here, Jesus once again has recreated the miracle that he first called Peter with. And he's also recreated the scene from the night where Peter had his failure. Jesus recreates both because he's saying, I still want you, Peter. But we have to talk about this. We have to deal with this. So verse 15 says, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John. Now, Jesus never calls Peter this, by the way. He's never once in three years called Peter by his full legal name. This would be like if my mom said, Kurt Andrew Barnes, when she said that I knew I was in some serious trouble. And Jesus says, Simon, son of John. And then he asks him this question, do you love me more than these? Now, commentators again are divided on what the than these is in reference to. Some people think he was pointing as his disciples and referring to them. Do you love me more than these? But I personally believe he was referencing the fish that Peter in the previous verses has just pulled off the boat by himself and apparently counted because John tells us there was 153 large fish. Jesus is saying, I called you away from fishing to be a fisher of men. I called you to something more with me, Peter. And are you just going to settle for a safe income? a safe life 
Or do you love me more, Peter? What do you want more? Do you love me more than these? And Peter replied, verse 15, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Then feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now, was Jesus just rubbing Peter's face in his failure? No. But that's what many people think that Jesus is doing here with Peter, but they're wrong. Because if Jesus wanted to shame Peter, what direction would Jesus point Peter towards? He would point him to his past. He would point him to his failure. But what does Jesus do? He points Peter towards his future. He points him forward. He says, do you love me, Peter? Yeah, you know I do. Then let's feed my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? Yeah, I know you do. So let's feed my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? I know you do. So let's feed my sheep. I think that's what Jesus is doing here. What he's actually doing in this moment is he's saving Peter's life. If Jesus doesn't recreate this moment with Peter, the moment where Peter failed, then every time a rooster crowed in the morning, Peter would be reminded of his failure. You're a loser. You're the one who betrayed him. You were supposed to be the rock. You you were supposed to be the strong one. And every time he heard that rooster, he'd have been reminded of that. He would have felt the shame of what he had done and it would have dominated his life and shaped his future. And I think Jesus is recreating this moment, the moment of Peter's greatest failure in order to heal him. And he will do the same for you. See, Jesus' arms of grace are open wide to you right now. And his relationship with you is still open. And yet I promise you, as you draw near to him, he will still say, we still need to deal with this. But Jesus will never put his hands on your wounds in order to hurt you. He puts his hands on you in order to heal you. And as you draw near to God, he's going to work with you on the parts of your life that have caused you so much pain. And I don't know what that is. Maybe it's a statement that your dad said to you a long time ago or your mom said to you a long time ago that you have absorbed into the deepest parts of who you are. Maybe it's approval that you never got from your parents. Maybe it's a wound from your church family. Maybe it's a thing that you did to someone else that you don't want to repeat to anyone, even yourself. But the shame of it haunts you. Some of you are so dominated by the wounds of your past that they dominate your present to the extent that they actually shape your future. (laughs) And Jesus wants more than that from you. And so he will take you to this place, the wounding, not in order to shame you, but to take the shame out of you. Not to relive the pain, but to relieve the pain. See, you can see it so clearly in this text. He comes to Peter and he says, we have to deal with this. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. I know, so let's move on. Do you love me? Yes, God, I love you. I know, so let's move on. Don't let the failures of your past determine your future any longer, Peter. Let's move on. Let's deal with these wounds. Let's see you healed. And it will be a process for you. Some of you, it's going to take counseling. Some of you, it's going to be sharing with your small group. Some of you, it's going to be through a group like Celebrate Recovery. 
but we need to deal with the wounds of our past. Because why? Jesus has a job for us to do. He has a future for us. He has an assignment for us. Just like Peter, he said, feed my sheep. Because listen, Jesus has sheep all over this world who are lost and scared and broken and suffering. The people of God are scattered everywhere and they're afraid. And the Father wants to use your life, your story, your pain, your experiences to help bless and comfort other people. 2 Corinthians 1.4 tells us this. He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us us. So Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, I want you to feed my sheep. Take care of them. Peter, don't get so wrapped up in your past that you become a victim and are no longer able to help the people that I came to save. Peter, I love you and the relationship is still open. Yes, what you did was bad and everyone saw it, but my grace is sufficient for you. So let's heal those wounds. And let's move on, Peter, because I want you to feed my sheep. That's his call for you today. You are not too far gone. He will put his hands on you today, not to wound you, but to heal you and to save your life. Johnny Cash had a great career. I love Johnny Cash's music. But like so many, Johnny Cash actually got hooked on drugs, specifically on amphetamines. And you can read all about this in his autobiography. He actually dedicated an entire chapter to his book about all the cars that he wrecked when he was high on drugs. He was a mess. And ultimately, his life got so bad that he torpedoed his career, lost his record label, he alienated his friends and his loved ones, and he tore his family apart, and his whole life went up in flames. So in that moment, he looked around and he said, you know what, I'm done with all of this. The world would be better off without me. And so he came up with a plan. He went to Nickajack Cave on the Tennessee River with his drugs and with a flashlight. And he said, I'm gonna crawl into this cave as deep as I can with my stash and with my flashlight. And when the batteries of my flashlight run out, I'm gonna just disappear and Johnny Cash will be no more. And that's exactly what he did. And that's what shame will do to you. It'll make you hide away. He crawled into that cave as deep as he could go. And as his flashlight ran out, he, he crawled into a ball. And he said, in that moment, the strangest thing happened. He felt God. In that moment of his greatest shame, he felt the presence of God come closer to him than he'd ever felt him before. And God spoke to him and said, No, Johnny, I still want you. Get up. And he said he was so deep inside the cave that he knew there was no way that he could get back out even if he wanted to. But God encouraged him just to start moving. So he did. He started moving, crawling through the darkness, and eventually he came to a place where he could see some light, and he kept crawling towards the light. And when he got to the mouth of the cave, two of his friends were standing there. He said, I don't know how they got there because I didn't tell anyone where I was going, but they were there. And his friends took him to the hospital because he was still hooked and high on amphetamines. And that began the day that he journeyed, beginning there to get sober, to get healed, and after that, he launched into a stretch of his career where he was doing crusades with Billy Graham, where he was singing about God, the God who could save a wretch like me. He made movies about Jesus and about the Apostle Paul. And at the end of his life, they were playing his videos on MTV, where he was declaring the goodness, the kindness, and the mercy of God towards sinners. Friends in Christ. For many of you who are out there listening today, you have walked away from God and you feel like there's no turning back. There's no way for you to get back to the place where you are in relationship 
where you're following after God and you are wrong. All you have to do today to begin is to turn back towards Jesus to take one step because what you will find is he's right there and he's kind and he's gracious and he's generous and he's loving and he's merciful and his desire for you today is that you would come back to him, that you would follow him. Now, after this in our text where Jesus spends this time with Peter, I love what happens next. Peter turns around and he sees John, the disciple known as the disciple whom Jesus loved, standing there. And he says this. Verse 20, Peter turns and he sees the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had also had leaned back against him during the supper and he had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remains until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. I love this addition to the story, this scene, because after Jesus says, follow me, Peter, Peter first, before he responds, looks back and says, what about him? What about him? Now, um, maybe your mom is like my mom and you heard this a lot growing up, but maybe after a fight with your brothers and sisters, you said, well, what about Kevin? Or what about Kirsten? What, what's their punishment? And your mom would say to you, we're not talking about them right now. We're talking about you. And this is exactly what Jesus is doing with Peter. He's keeping him focused on what's most important. Jesus is keeping Peter focused on his own pursuit, his own following of Jesus. See, for many of you right now, you're thinking, I would follow Jesus, but my boyfriend doesn't. Well, guess what? We're not talking about your boyfriend right now. We're talking about you. Well, I would follow Jesus, but because my family situation, no, we're not talking about your family situation right now. We're talking about you. You follow him. But at my school or at my work, we're not talking about those places right now talking to you. You follow him. Now, whenever I talk about this, there's always somebody that says, hey, that's great. That's great. But you don't really know what I've done. And Jesus can't just wave his wand and dismiss the things that I've seen and the things that I've been a part of. And I want to tell you something wonderful today. That's not what Jesus did. How can Jesus be so gracious to Peter? When Peter denies even knowing him, how can Jesus be so gracious? Because Jesus didn't just dismiss Peter's sin. He paid for it. He looked at him and said, I know what you did, Peter, but I paid for it. I know what you were doing. I know what you were a part of, and I paid for it. I buried it, Peter. I know what was happening in your life, but I took it to the grave with me. And now that I've raised to life from the dead, I have paid for your sin once and for all, no matter how ugly, no matter how sick, no matter how bad it is, I've paid for it. And Jesus' offer to you today, friends, is this reminder. Your sins have been forgiven. If you are in Christ Jesus, they've been paid for. So don't allow any longer the weight of your sin to keep you isolated from Jesus. Run to him today. Jump out of the boat and get swimming because what you will find is our gracious, loving, merciful Father. He will have his arms wide open to you today. It will change everything. Peter's future was changed in this moment. He could have just gone away, but Jesus came after him. And he's coming after you right now. Do you feel it? Can you feel that Jesus is pursuing you right now? He wants you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants you back. And if today you would surrender, you would jump in, you would come back, you would find his arms are open wide to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these wonderful truths. Thank you that your arms are open wide to us right now. And thank you that no matter what we've done, 
no matter what we've seen, no matter what we've been a part of, no matter what we've allowed into our life, thank you that you are there with arms wide open today. I pray that you'd help us, God, to take that first step towards you. And I thank you that as we do, we will find you are right there. I pray for many of my friends that are watching today, God, that they would commit themselves to following you once again that they would commit themselves to being a disciple, that they would commit themselves to stop hiding away from the hurt of their past and allow you to put your hands on it and to bring healing, to allow you to begin the process of restoration, of bringing them, God, back into the place where they can have an intimacy in their relationship with you today. I thank you, Jesus, that you are so for us and not against us. And I pray for many people, God, to respond to this message today by recommitting themselves once again to following you. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let's continue in our service today by worshiping. We have so much to be thankful for. No matter what you're facing and no matter how difficult things are out there right now, we have so much to be thankful for. So let's praise and worship Jesus together.
If you'd like prayer today, remember there's a, a prayer team ready for the next 15 minutes to pray with you. Just click that in the live chat button and we'd love to pray for you, whatever your needs are today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning. It was great to worship with you. We'll see you soon.